I care about the average, of course, but when you are in front of your patient, the average is just a number. You want to know if your patient is going to respond or not. So, last week, a pleptologist, Angel Aledo Serrano, was talking to us all about his review of a former paper all about levetiracetam slash Keppra and how we need to be more precise when prescribing it. Think precision medicine. This week, Angel elaborates further, explaining to us the benefits of whole exome sequencing, which is a form of genetic testing, for people with an epilepsy, how the levetiracetam can actually have negative impacts on some people with an epilepsy, leading to polypharmacy, and the likelihood of improving treatment as a result of improved appointment quality between a neurologist and a person with epilepsy, slash their family. I am an epileptologist and neurologist working in Madrid. Uh, I am seeing both children and adults. I think that's kind of uh, not very frequent. Uh, I don't do the transition from children to adults. I am the transition. Would you say it's, it would be ideal for most or all people diagnosed with an epilepsy to have whole exome sequencing to try and identify any type of mutation, for instance? So that's, that's a really good question and it's something which is changing. Uh, over time and for example some years ago we were saying no so MRI uh, the neuroimaging is only um, indicated for this kind of epilepsy and not for this kind of epilepsy and now we are doing MRI for everybody and I guess the same scenario is with uh, genetic testing so we are having really specific indications the indications are growing and are expanding, but still uh, we say that it's only indicated for people who are starting in the first years of life. So if you have a late onset epilepsy, uh, that would be not indicated uh, a genetic testing because you, you have uh, a lower diagnostic yield. Ah, but then, I don't know, to be sort of potentially an annoying patient, I could say, well, just because I might be one of the people have, having a lower diagnostic yield, it doesn't mean that I shouldn't have it. Uh, probably in some years we will do it for everybody, even if you have only 2% of uh, probabilities to have a diagnosis, that's uh, worth it because yeah. you will have uh, more information to decide your treatment so of course but of course in in, in general the most important are uh, uh, good long long video eg so to to better understand the the epilepsy syndrome it's a generalized one it's a focal one which kind of uh, discharges you have uh, epileptic form activity which is typical of a malformation of cortical development so then you have to look uh, uh, carefully to the mri and then decide not to put levetiracetam and maybe at first anti medication so that's that's very important and what we are also understanding in the last few years is that that sometimes uh, the genetic testing could help in the safety profile and again this is very important because sometimes we we end up in this uh, cascade prescription i don't know if you use that in english but it's like you put an anti medication for for example levetiracetam you produce uh, a mood disorder and then you you mm, secondarily you produce another uh, prescription of uh, antidepressant. So then the antidepressant put uh, uh, less libido or uh, sexual problems and then you are using uh, Viagra. And then you are, <laughs> so it's a... Uh... Yeah, and so it brings on basically polypharmacy, a multiple, brings on a greater diagnosis of conditions and then more drugs and you get stuck in this loop, right? Yeah, and this is well studied that you are doing that if you have shorter consultations. So, of course, for a neurologist, if you have only five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes of consultation, it's really difficult to go a step back, take perspective and put, uh, discontinue this medication, go down with this medication, explain a new medication, 
um, and, and make it in, in detail. So if you have less time, you put more medications in general. It's better, it's, it's, it's easier. So this is something I, I, I'm saying always in my talks, to try to, to change uh, and deprescribe. So stop more medications. By reducing the number of medications, you're going to reduce the side effects likely that the person experiences. Um, sometimes the negative side of the medications can outweigh the positive impact of a medication. Um, I've spoken to um, clinicians who've told me that sometimes they'll have a patient with an, with an epilepsy. He'll say, do you know what? I would rather have an extra few seizures a month um, by, um, through taking a lower dosage of this drug so that I can go to work and I have kind of improved cognitive function. And it's all about that balance, isn't it? And I guess a clinician learns that through getting to know their patient better through longer appointment times. Yeah, 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 yeah. and sometimes just patients have lost their their expectations to be better, and they are they are uh, understanding or they are taking for granted that it's normal to be with a mental fog, uh, to be. Uh, because sometimes you don't know how are you after a long time uh, of uh, being depressed or being with uh, less cognitive skills, you you end up thinking that this is yourself, this is you. Uh, you don't know how, how intelligent you are uh, without the medication. So true. <laughs> it's like you're singing <laughs> about my life <laughs> and the life of so many people. That's exactly it. And then if somebody has... Felt, like you say, felt this way for a long time, been on these drugs for a long time. You can you can be scared to reduce those drugs or take those drugs, especially if they have had some usefulness in reducing the frequency or severity of your seizures. And yeah, it's like you're juggling all the time. And I think that that's where we really need people like yourself, Akel, who appreciate the that juggle and how to prioritize really quality of life and we need more data on that as well because uh, some something which we are also trying to show in in our paper is that we still have uh, gray scenarios uh, so uh, situations where we don't know what to do and we don't have information informa uh, enough information so uh, in the end, we are just using your experience, which is, of course, that's really important, but uh, it's not uh, evidence-based. And this is also maybe because uh, in the last few years, this is uh, maybe it's changing, but in the past, we were not really interested in, interested in this kind of specific profile of the drug. So when we study uh, a new drug, uh, we are just seeing the average of uh, the effectiveness or the, the average of the safety profile, but we are not studying which kind of patient is uh, improving and which kind of patient is not improving. So maybe we should change uh, our mindset on that. I care about the, about, about the average, of course, but when you are in front of your patient, the average is just a number. You want to know if your patient is going to respond or not. Your, your patient is going to have the uh, adverse event or not. And also your patient uh, care about that. So, yeah, this is something we have to change in the research, uh, in the research area. And so if we have anybody listening right now um, who would is interested in um, getting involved in research along these lines. Um, would it be useful to get in touch with you, Ankel, or what do you think? So at the time, we are not uh, doing any ex any study on this, but it would be really nice to, to have the data. Of course, they, they can reach me out. We are not studying this specific uh, about uh, uh, levetiracetam, but we are doing all uh, other kind of uh, studies for example, trying to see if uh, a specific gene is responding to specific medications or uh, other, other studies are, for example, in, in using qualitative methodologies, 
qualitative methodologies, I think they are very important because they are not statistics, they are interviews. So uh, deep conversations. That's extremely important in the epilepsies because everybody's um, lives and bodies and brains are so incredibly different and how they experience um, the epilepsy and comorbidities, which are really not comorbidities, they're part of the epilepsy. Um, it's all different for everybody. So yeah, that's why I, I appreciate what you're saying regarding qualitative research. And this is crazy because we, we have been like, I don't know, 10 years, the, la the last 10 years saying that epilepsy is more than seizures, but still, uh, I, I don't feel the, the difference in, in, of course, we are improving in, in a lot of areas, but it's crazy that after so many years saying the same, uh, it's just makeup. It's just, uh, it's, it's not uh, something which is truly changing. I don't know. Sometimes you just change by repetition and repetition. So maybe we should just repeat the same. <laughs> Keep saying this in every conference and people with epilepsy or mums and dads or carers listening, the epilepsy is more than seizures. I think appointments bring that up. So the epilepsy includes this behavioral difficulty uh, for somebody or their cognitive function or the physical issues that come alongside seizures <laughs> yeah and you know now we are talking about a lot about how to change uh, human behavior and clinician behavior and uh, what we are learning and this is coming from the climate anxiety so i'm working a lot in the uh, climate change area and how that's impacting people with epilepsy and the uh, clinicians mm. uh, caring for people with epilepsy because we want people to change the, their behaviors, but uh, saying, telling them mm, climate change is going to be terrible, uh, that's not changing anything. That's only frightening <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. causing uh, climate anxiety. And at the same time, if we say uh, epilepsy is more than seizures, so, uh, but we only say that, uh, you just cause anxiety maybe in the clinician because sometimes they, they don't have the tools to help the patients um, beyond the anti medications. They don't have the time to have these deep conversations. Uh, so maybe it's more powerful to talk about the good examples. So the positive ways on how people, patients and also doctors are addressing this issue. So, for example, uh, fighting with the hospital, trying to make uh, longer consultations to talk about all the all the things, or having other specialists uh, around you to talk about the other things, or having emails, or uh, having pre consultations. You, you were talking about that, no? How to prepare the consultation. Yeah and make it more effective. So maybe we should talk about that. So not how bad we are doing that, or, <laughs> but uh, how good we can do. <laughs> yeah, preparation. And we want to look at quality of time um, with patients, clinicians, rather than quantity of time. Sometimes we're limited with the amount of time we have together. So let's make it of higher quality for both parties. I think that's great. Thank you so much for joining us, Angel. Uh, very kind of you to donate your time to us and no doubt we will speak soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Tori, for what you are doing in general and for having me.